Good afternoon, everyone. All right, my name is Aaron Espinoza and I am the Library and Observatory Director. And, oh man, I am uh, just humbled and appreciative for our residents, our audience, our patrons, our community leaders to allow us to thrive for the last two years. So on behalf of the Rancho Mirage Library, the city of Rancho Mirage and our staff, I wanna thank you all for being here. Thank you. Before we get started, I would like to ask that everybody silence their phones. Um, all right, it's been a while since I've been in front of this many people. So, uh, our last indo indoor in-person lecture was two years, 30 days, 760 days, 18,220 hours, and for those of you that are counting, it is 1,093,780 minutes. And let me tell you, our team has been counting. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not thank the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory Foundation. It is without their support that we could not offer all these amazing programs virtually for the last two years and now in person free to our community. So thank you to our foundation. This is just one of many programs that we do here at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory, and I am happy to announce that we will be having some more in-person programming before the, the summer heats up here. So uh, if you saw it on the screen, uh, next Thursday through, uh, I'm sorry, next Wednesday through Friday, we will have our semi-annual book sale. We have hundreds of thousands of books that will be replacing where you are seating today. Um, in the month of April, we will be launching our library telescope program where you can check out a telescope just like you can any library book. Um, next Wednesday, April 20th, I think many of us have seen in the news, but Livestream Blood Blank uh, does need our donations, so we will be hosting a blood drive here uh, on Wednesday, April 20th. And then the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival Writers Series has announced two dates coming in May, uh, and we will be hosting uh, Jeff Dyer and his new book, The Last Days of Roger Federer and Other Endings. And then we also will host uh, Congressman Adam Schiff in conversation with Barbara Boxer, speaking about uh, Congressman Schiff's new book, Midnight in Washington, How We Almost Lost Our Democracy and Still Could. So as I said, we've got lots of programming coming up. Uh, if you have not had the opportunity to pick up a free book or free books as you walk out, we have a cart uh, outside, uh, courtesy of the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival. Um, so I'm very, look, uh, very much, uh, please take those books. I would, uh, if they're all gone today, thank you. <laughs> um, continue to look for our e-blast. We are sending all of our uh, correspondence via our, our e-blast uh, for the next uh, few months. But at the end of late May, we will start our quarterly program book booklet back up, okay? Just a show of hands, how many people are here for the very first time? Oh my God, bless you all. Um, I, I can't say exactly all the things that we do and I hope that everybody that is here for the very first time comes and takes a tour of the observatory and I'll do that plug. That starts at three o'clock, sorry. Um, <laughs> So uh, our observatory, our library, um, we are the cultural center of the Rancho Mirage and we try to be the cultural center of the Coachella Valley. So uh, I welcome everybody here for the first time and everybody back for, uh, um, since this pan uh, pandemic. So for today's program, presenter Mike, uh, Stephen C. Smith is a film historian, a four time Emmy nominee who has produced over 200 documentaries for television and other media. His project collaborators include Julia Andrews, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Martin Scorsese, Clint Eastwood, James Cameron, and Cindy Portier. Smith served as a supervising producer for the long-running series A&E Biography and is the author of two biographies, A Heart at Fire Center, The Life and Music of Bernard Herrmann, and the focus of today's talk, Music by Max Steiner, The Epic Life of Hollywood's Most Influential Composer. We are also proud that Stephen and his wife are new to the Rancho Mirage community. 
Um, they re recently relocated here right to Rancho Mirage. So with no further ado, please help me welcome to the stage, Stephen C. Smith. Well, thank you, Aaron, TJ, the entire team here. And yes, as Aaron said, I can now say hello neighbors, I'm sure, to many of you. And I can't tell you what a thrill it is after talking about this subject to people online where I really had to assume that they were out there, uh, to seeing you all. It's, uh, it's a great, great pleasure and one that I know that the person we're talking about today would certainly appreciate. Well, you would think by the 21st century, all the good stories about movies were told, but I was very fortunate when in 2015, I was asked to tell this one by Oxford University. And it is a remarkable story, and I will share just a few highlights of it with you today. But I, I just wanna ask, am I in a crowd of movie lovers? Are these people who love to watch good movies? Okay, that's what I thought. Well, excellent, and do think of questions because I very much look forward to answering any questions you have uh, after the talk. Well, let's begin with a question. I wonder, when I say the words film music, what do you think of, what do you hear? Well, I'm gonna guess that for many of you, yes, I heard that name out there. Those words conjure up the music of John Williams and maybe the music of Star Wars. Today I am going to be telling the story of the composer who really paved the way for John Williams and virtually, well, let's say every film and television composer who is working today. But before we meet him, here is a short excerpt from his work from one of his most famous films, and I encourage you to both watch and to listen. Oops, let's see. Let's try this. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a movie scene. Oops, we don't need to see it twice though. I'm delighted to hear your applause for that. That was of course 1933's King Kong, scored by Maximilian Raoul Walter Steiner, better known simply to us as Max Steiner. And it was Steiner who more than any other single person laid out the ground rules of how to create underscoring for movies at the time when Hollywood was changing from silent films to sound. In his 35-year career in motion pictures, Max Steiner worked on about 300 movies. Yes, I said 300 movies, starting at the age of 41. He was nominated for 24 Academy Awards, and he won three. As for what he was like as a person, well, he wasn't tall, I can relate. He was five foot four. He was funny, he loved to make wisecracks and terrible puns. He had an appropriately cynical view about Hollywood, or at least some of the people in it, and he seemed to always have a cigar in his mouth. So he may sound like a typical Hollywood character, but as I discovered, Max Steiner was also a deeply romantic person, and I think he related intensely to many of the characters in his best known films, whether that was Scarlett O'Hara and her fight to rebuild a family dynasty, or Rick Blaine, whose cynical wit covers a broken heart, or even King Kong and his vulnerability to beauty. All these are part of Max's own story. But why did he have the right skills to pioneer this form of movie music? To answer that, we need to travel to the late 19th century and one of the most elegant, exciting cities in Europe, Vienna. Max Steiner was born in Vienna in 1888 a time when the, t the city was teeming with people who were about to change the world, people like Sigmund Freud and Gustav Klimt. 
It was also an exciting time for music and theater, and Max was really set up for success at a young age. He was born into a family that was already famous for producing some of the most popular entertainment in Vienna. They were like the Ziegfelds of Austria. His grandfather, Maximilian, who he was named after, was the stage producer who convinced the world's most famous living composer, Johann Strauss Jr., the Waltz King, to start writing stage musicals, or operettas as they were called. And I'm sure many people in this room got a very edifying, uh, heard a very edifying talk about operettas recently. Well, if it weren't for Maximilian Steiner, we wouldn't have all those great Strauss operettas. The result was a string of hit musicals written by Strauss that were beloved around the world, and the most popular is still performed today, the operetta Die Fledermaus, also filmed many times. Max Steiner's father, Gabor, was also a showman and really a visionary. Gabor produced everything from symphony concerts to vaudeville shows. He was so well known in Vienna that he was decorated by Emperor Franz Joseph, head of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Gabor's most ambitious creation was a vast amusement park called Venice in Vienna. 60 years before Disneyland, this multi-acre venue offered a recreation of Venice, Italy, complete with canals and gondolas and palazzos that were really gift shops or beer halls. It was a really remarkable place, as you can see from these photos. Uh, visitors could ride roller coasters on it. This is 1895. They could listen to gramophone records, which were a novelty. And the most popular attraction there was the Riesenrad, the Ferris wheel, which remains one of Vienna's most iconic objects, also featured in later years in many movies, like The Third Man. Well, Max's father, Gabor, put that up. Most incredibly, I discovered, patrons at the park could watch silent movies just months after films had been shown publicly anywhere in the world. That was Gabor Steiner hearing about a new invention and saying, let's try this out. So it's no surprise that his son Max was interested in music and theater at an early age. He received encouragement from Johann Strauss Jr. He got advice from Gustav Mahler and he considered the composer Richard Strauss his godfather. Max's first song was published when he was nine years old. Here's the sheet music. I suspect dad had something to do with that and we do see his mother and father on the cover of the sheet music. But at age 19, Max did have a genuine success with an original operetta performed in Vienna. So it seemed as if he was going to slide into a successful career like his father's and his grandfather's. Then in 1908, disaster struck. 20-year-old Max opened the newspaper one day and read that his father, Gabor, had declared bankruptcy and Max was on his own. So he quickly moved to London, where people like creditors were not looking for people named Steiner. And he started over from scratch after this amazing childhood with all these famous people. He just started completely over. During this time, he wrote music uncredited for London's most important productions of Shakespeare done at His Majesty's Theatre. He conducted in Europe, in Cairo, in South Africa, anywhere someone needed a composer or a conductor or musical director, he worked there. In 1913, he had a great success conducting a hit musical review in London called Come Over Here. That's a postcard, believe it or not, uh, for that show. Even then, the shows were advertised with postcards. For a time, its star was the American comedian Fanny Bryce, who we know from the movie and Broadway musical Funny Girl, Barbara Streisand portrayed her. Well, Max worked with the real Fanny Bryce. And by 1914, Max Steiner had a thriving career in Britain as a musical director. At least he did until July of 1914 and the declaration of what would become the First World War. Overnight, Max was an enemy alien simply because he was an Austrian in Britain. He was broke, which was all too common since he tended to spend more money than he had. And he had to borrow money and make a frantic escape to a country that was not involved in the war. Luckily for us, he chose America. And by the early 1920s, he had climbed up again from the absolute bottom to become one of the busiest orchestrators and conductors on Broadway, working with the top songwriters and producers of the day. And just look at this list. I've even left some off, like Florenz Ziegfeld, who produced the Ziegfeld Follies. Max worked with them all. The most important of these Broadway shows he did was the 1924 Gershwin musical Lady Be Good, starring Fred Astaire and Fred's sister Adele. Working on this show and others like it, 
really expanded Max's musical vocabulary as night after night he orchestrated and conducted this new jazzy American music. That show has just one great song after another, like fascinating rhythm. Well, conducting theater orchestras at a time before they were using microphones, Steiner also learned how to make sure that music did not overwhelm a performer's speech, which would come in very handy soon in Hollywood. Five years after Lady Be Good, the next big breakthrough came in Max Steiner's life, an invitation from, yes, Hollywood at the end of 1929. It came from RKO Pictures, a studio that had opened just months earlier in 1928. And here you see their very modest announcement in the trades of their existence. A titan is born. They really hadn't done anything yet, but that's Hollywood for you. And uh, they, weren't, uh, they were new, but so was something else in 1929, and that was sound. Talkies were just coming in. 1929 was the year that Hollywood officially switched from making silent films to sound films only. So every studio, including RKO, needed actors who could speak well, and they certainly needed musicians who could compose and orchestrate and conduct. So let's hear from Max himself some audio uh, about how this job offer came about, and you'll hear just a little bit of his sense of humor at the beginning. Max, how did you get to Hollywood? On the train. <laughs> well, I mean, what brought all this about? I was doing a show called Sons of Guns, and William LeBaron, who was then the president, of RKO came to, to the opening. I had an orchestra, 35 men, and every one of my men played about five different instruments. At one time we had 30 violins, then we had 20 trumpets, and he was out of his mind. When the show was over, he came down to the pit. I was playing the exit march, and he says, Max, will you come and see me tomorrow? You've got to come to Hollywood. And I said, all right. And two weeks later, I came to Hollywood. Well, timing is everything, and the timing of this offer was perfect because two months before that conversation and before Max came to Hollywood, the stock market crashed, and that, of course, ushered in the Great Depression and led to the closing of many Broadway theaters. Unfortunately, the Depression would also impact Hollywood, and by mid-1930, just a few months after Max arrived, the box office was falling for most of the studios, but especially at RKO, which was releasing a lot of expensive flops. The studio began laying off staff, but Max was fortunate. As the music department shrank, he was elevated from the ranks of being an orchestrator and occasional composer to being head of the RKO music department. But even with that promotion, he found himself rather frustrated because he was limited in what he was allowed to do. Just because Hollywood movies now had sound, that did not necessarily mean that those movies had much music. If it was a musical, of course, there were songs. Comedies and dramas, very little music. Usually only music for the main title and then the end title. Max wanted to bring more underscoring to film music we would hear when people were speaking or during silent sequences of action but he was usually prevented from doing so by literal-minded producers at the studio who kept asking, but Max, won't the audience wonder, where is the music coming from? As if 20, 30 years of silent movies hadn't had music, but the realism of the talkies just made every producer, virtually every producer, convinced that you could not have underscoring. So instead of that kind of music, what audiences often heard was a lot of hiss and crackle and pop on the soundtrack, which created awkward silences and really slowed down a film's pace. Here is a good, or should I say, a very bad example of that from 1931, an RKO film. 30 seconds, and I promise it's really only 30 seconds, from the Foreign Legion drama, Beau Ideal. You are about to hear some of the loudest silence you have ever heard. You admit, do you, that during the attack on Fort Sindonov by the Arabs, you stabbed your superior officer? Yes! 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 Why? Tell me why. Because it was a swine, an inhuman blackguard. That movie was not a success. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you love uh, the film Singing in the Rain as I do, and its whole picture of this crazy transitional time, really not that exaggerated. 
Well, Max had to work with those kinds of movies for two years, not getting to put very much music into them, until after two long years, he got a break. RKO hired a new head of production, a 29-year-old dynamo named David O. Selznick. Selznick was a kindred spirit when it came to using music in sound film, and together he and Max set out to bring full, sophisticated underscoring to, the, to motion pictures, starting with a movie that's forgotten today but was very influential in 1932. That movie is called Symphony of Six Million with Irene Dunn, Ricardo Cortez, and the plot of this film is not important. It's about a doctor who forgets his family roots and his Jewish faith as he moves higher and higher in New York society. What is important, and what I was just astonished when I found the original screenplay in an archive, is that not only did Selznick and Steiner planned to have underscoring, different themes for the characters. I'll get into what they did later. But not only did they plan to have underscoring, the screenplay says at the very top of page one, note, the mo this motion picture, the entire picture, is to be accompanied by a symphonic underscoring. So they're saying even before a frame of film is shot, how important the underscoring is going to be in the film. When they went out and were shooting the movie, there was a little place on the production call sheet saying what kind of underscoring might be written later. This was very new, experimental, revolutionary turf. And it probably is a good time to dig in just briefly and ask what made a Max Steiner score so special and then what were his trademarks that he used throughout his career? Well, here are four, and I promise you this talk will not be a technical one. Uh, number one on the list, leitmotifs. This is the last three-syllable musical term you will hear today. And it means something very simple. It just means that Max wrote separate, distinct musical themes for characters, which he would then develop throughout a film score to take us inside those characters' thoughts and emotions. So as their characters changed, so would their music. If Ricardo Cortez was thinking about Irene Dunn, we might hear her theme on the soundtrack to help us understand what he was thinking of in that silent close-up. Number two on my list is orchestral color, choosing the right instruments and instrumental combinations to make us feel the atmosphere of a place or an emotion. Number three on the list, key changes. When a phrase of music or a chorus of a song goes up or down, we call that a key change or a modulation. And Steiner was the master of using key changes climbing upwards to create a sense of excitement or exhilaration in his music. You will definitely hear some examples of that. Number four on the list, melody. Not every great film composer writes great melodies. The subject of my first book, Bernard Herrmann, who wrote many of the Alfred Hitchcock scores, did not write great melodies, but was a great film composer. But Max Steiner certainly was a great writer of melodies. He had a gift for that kind of soaring lyricism that John Williams has today. And as a result, we remember his themes for characters, and we often want to hear them away from the film. Well, Steiner's score for Symphony of Six Million was a revelation for critics and audiences. It was praised in dozens of reviews, and that was sort of like a starting pistol had gone off for Selznick and Steiner. They began applying this new approach to most, really all of the movies they were making at RKO in 1932 in movies like the first and I think best version of that famous short story, The Most Dangerous Game. You Probably know its plot about a famous animal hunter, played in this film by Joel McRae, who becomes the hunted on a remote island controlled by the sadistic Count Zaroff. The climax of the film is Zaroff's hunt of McRae and Feyre's characters, and the last third of this movie required a lot of big, exciting, fast music. Music that had to, uh, and you see a page of the score here, by the way, music that required many notes that had to be written in a few days because Max was overseeing every single film that RKO was making that year. But for the, not the first time and definitely not the last time, he really delivered. This was someone who didn't seem to need much sleep in his life. He wrote thrilling chase music that paved the way for countless action scores to follow. Here's two and a half minutes from the climax of The Most Dangerous Game, and I've added a little text on screen to help you follow the way that Max has put the music together and what themes he's using that we've heard earlier in the film. They include two themes that he writes for Count Zaroff, one of which is called The Russian Waltz. Ha <laughs> ha 
fun, right? And that, that was made just months after that Foreign Legion movie I showed you. So it's just sort of astronomical how quickly Selznick and Steiner were pushing things forward. Well, not all of Max's movies in that breakthrough year of 1932 were dramas. And one was a very fun comedy called The Half-Naked Truth. For one scene, director Gregory LaCava needed someone to play a Broadway conductor. And the result is the one movie in which we really get to see some good shots of Max Steiner on camera. And once again, the plot isn't important. Lupi Velez plays a carnival dancer who pretends to be a European ballet dancer to get onto Broadway. And when her ballet act starts to flop, she changes back to the dancing she knows best. The main thing to do is see if you recognize the conductor. <laughs> It's a very fun movie, and by the way, if you, all of these are on either, uh, if you still have your DVD player, they're either on disc or they're streaming, so I'm always happy to help you find them if you ever want to see them. Well, despite a really excellent slate of films produced by Selznick and mostly scored by Steiner, things were pretty grim at RKO by December of 1932. Thanks to the Depression, the studio was on the verge of bankruptcy, and Selznick resigned to take a more prestigious position at MGM, the Tiffany of Studios. Fortunately, he left behind his biggest, most ambitious project, which had been in production for over a year. Yes, King Kong. But as this epic adventure film neared completion, some executives at RKO started to panic. They watched the movie without music, and some of them were underwhelmed by the stop-motion animation. They worried that they might have a very expensive flop on their hands, and they told Max Steiner not to waste any money writing original music for the film. Fortunately, King Kong's creator, producer, and co-director Marion C. Cooper felt very differently. As Steiner would recall, Cooper said to me, Maxi, go ahead and score the picture to the best of your ability, and don't worry about the cost because I will pay for the orchestra. Well, the result was an epic music score that many people consider the most influential in Hollywood history, a combination of Wagnerian opera, cutting-edge dissonance, and also the romantic lyrical music that Max knew so well from growing up in Austria. Here's a very short clip of Max talking about that score. King Kong, of course, you had a great chance to really do anything you wanted to, from dissonances to nice melodies and so forth. I mean, it was built for music. 
Steiner knew that King Kong's first appearance was the make or break sequence for the film. If audiences laughed at the giant gorilla, the movie would fail, and so probably would RKO. Well, that sequence is now iconic, and Steiner played, I think, a major part in its success, but I will let you be the judge of that, because I have something rare. I have Kong's entrance, first the way those RKO executives saw it, without music, and then with Max Steiner's score. So here it is, and yes, without music, I, I think you'll find it plays a little longer and get ready for some screaming. Fay Ray was a great screamer, but I'll be curious to get your take on the two versions. In saying that a movie needs music, in no way am I putting down the brilliance of the people who made these films. I have to say, King Kong is probably my favorite movie, but just as a recipe needs to have all the ingredients, and if you leave out a really important one, it cannot taste the way it should. I think that's the way a lot of films are. They, are, they, are just need, they need that music to provide the emotional cement. Well, by the time King Kong opened in March of 1933, RKO had declared bankruptcy. But Kong was a massive hit, and it kept the studio open. The music would also inspire generations of composers to become composers for film. And I'll just mention one of them, Jerry Goldsmith, who sc scored films like Patton and so many others. He said of Kong, I'm doing what I'm doing because of it. By 1934, just months later, all the major movie studios had their own busy in-house composers. But Steiner continued to be regarded as top in his field. He could add a missing psychological dimension to characters through music in films like Of Human Bondage, which made Betty Davis a star, and The Informer, a John Ford drama that won Max Steiner his first Academy Award. And to show you the kind of attention to detail 
that Max had. To keep his music from competing with the dialogue, he would write above or below the pitch of an actor's voice after, ter after determining where that voice would be on a musical scale. So I was able to go through all of his handwritten scores, and uh, they're filled with copious notes. And on his handwritten score for a later Betty Davis film, he writes, uh, he makes a note that, quote, Miss Davis speaks between E and F. So in other words, right above or below her voice, just great attention to detail. During the 1930s, he also played a key role in RKO's most popular movie series, The Great Musicals, starring his old Broadway friend, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And here we see Max with Astaire and Mark Sandrich, who directed three of the Astaire Rogers films that Max worked on. So what did he do exactly on these? Well, he would work closely with Fred Astaire to transform, say, a, an Irving Berlin song into an intricate dance routine. So a three-minute song into a number that was five minutes, seven minutes, even 17 minutes in the case of the Continental and the Gay Divorce. And Fred Astaire liked to have dramatic pauses in the music, maybe to showcase the sound of taps. And he loved to have big dramatic builds up, build ups in the music and then a sudden stop. So Max and his team made all of that happen. To give you an example, here's the start of the main title of Top Hat. And I think that Max Steiner gives that great Irving Berlin song a real electricity and excitement by adding this very high line of strings over the melody right at the beginning. After that, we will hear an example of those sharp contrasts between orchestra and tap sounds between loud and soft that I mentioned from the song, Isn't This a Lovely Day, also from Top Hat. watch that movie just about every day and be happy. <laughs> well, Max was one of the hardest working people in a very hard working industry, but as you can see, he was also quite playful. Some of that play cost him dearly, because although he made the equivalent of millions of dollars during his career, he spent even more. He was addicted to gambling, he was supporting many family members in Austria, and by 1933 he was paying two alimonies to showgirls with whom he had had brief marriages. In 1936, he married for a third time, but to a partner much more suited to him, Louise Kloss, a sophisticated musician who was the harpist on Max's scores. And I love this Christmas card of theirs I found from the year 1936. That same year of 1936, Max left RKO, where he felt underappreciated and underpaid, for reason, I think, and he accepted the job of musical director at Selznick International, a new independent studio run by his old friend, David O. Selznick. Max greatly admired Selznick, but surprisingly, this job as Selznick's musical director lasted barely one year. How did that, why did it end so abruptly? Well, here's the movie where the fallout happened, the original version of A Star is Born, released in 1937. Since Max had worked with Selznick five years earlier at RKO, Selznick was beginning to change. He wanted to work 24 hours, and he was taking legal speed drugs like Benzedrine that made him manic and volatile and made him change his mind often. When Selznick first watched A Star is Born with Max's score, which was a very good score, Selznick was furious. He tore it to shreds in a memo saying how much he hated cue after cue. And Max, who was a very sensitive person, was stunned and deeply hurt. 
Now, here again, I get to share with you, though, something unusual and I think fun, and I, I would love to get your opinion about this when we, when we speak soon. Uh, I'm going to show you a party scene from the original Star is Born, and uh, the setup is that would-be actress Esther Blodgett, played by Janet Gaynor, is working as a server at a Hollywood party, trying to impress the various guests with her imitations of contemporary stars. Well, we're going to see this very short scene two ways. We're going to see it as it was released, which is to say a little bit of party music, then a really abrupt cut, and then no music at all for the rest of the scene. Then we're going to see it a different way, because Max saved his original recording of the music that was supposed to be in this scene. But first, let's see it the way it, it, it is in the final film, with a little music, then a sharp cut, and no music at all. Did you get to the preview last night? I did. Would you like a lethal order? They are very nice. Oh, thanks. Well, what did you think of the picture? We should have saved it for Thanksgiving. What a turkey. <laughs> Will you have some hors d'oeuvre? You do like hors d'oeuvre, don't you? I don't think there's anything so enjoyable as hors d'oeuvre before supper. And these are rarely delightful. And at the finish, the kid turns around and sings the lullaby to its mother. Uh, pardon it, big boy. But would you like a little uh, hors d'oeuvre? Uh, they say they're the best in town. Don't tell me. I know. Mae West. That's a great twist. But where are you going to find a two-month-old baby that can sing? So definitely a fun scene, but watching that without music, I feel like you don't know whether to laugh at Esther or with her. Well, here's the scene the way Max originally scored it, not the way it was released. And again, I've added some text on screen to help guide you through how Steiner approached scoring it. Did you get to the preview last night? I did. Would you like a lethal order? They are very nice. Well, thanks. What did you think of the picture? You should have saved it for Thanksgiving. What a turkey. Oh. <laughs> Will you have some hors d'oeuvre? You do like hors d'oeuvre, don't you? I don't think there's anything so enjoyable as hors d'oeuvre before supper. And these are rarely delightful. Finish, the kid turns around and sings the lullaby to its mother. Uh, pardon it, big boy, but would you like a little uh, harder? Uh, they say they're the best in town. Don't tell me. I know, Mae West. That's a great twist. Where are you going to find a two-month-old baby that can sing? Well, Steiner was so upset with all the changes made to his score for A Star is Born that he resigned from Selznick International. He told Selznick that he valued him very much as a friend, but he just couldn't work under those circumstances. But he did so because he had just received an even better job offer, and this time it would lead to the perfect partnership. The same week he left Selznick, Max signed on as a staff composer at Warner Brothers. His salary was the modern equivalent of nearly $30,000 a week. Unlike Selznick, Warner's was producing a ton of movies in a wide range of genres, and this is an infinitesimal fraction of the ones that Max scored. Period epics, crime thrillers, romantic dramas, comedies, a little of everything. No wonder he wrote a friend that Warner Brothers was the right place to be. And within weeks of starting there, Max put his mark on not just the movies that he scored, but nearly all of the films that Warner Brothers released by writing the studio's fanfare. <laughs> By 
By 1938, he was scoring many films destined to be classics, but he was also working around the clock, getting very little sleep. He was getting deeper in debt, and there was another bigger source of stress. His father, Gabor, and other family members he loved were still in Austria. And on March 12, 1938, Hitler's troops marched into the country and declared the Anschluss. Austria was now part of the Third Reich. Max's family was Jewish at the time of his birth. When Max was a child, Gabor had had the family convert to Christianity because there was so much anti-Semitism even then in Austria. But that conversion would not have mattered to the Third Reich. Gabor would still be considered a Jew. Steiner worked day and night pulling strings with the State Department to get his father out of Austria before the borders closed. And he did get him out. He saved his father's life. I think Max's close relationship with his father, with the Steiner family name and its legacy, all that had a lot to do with why in 1939, he begged his boss, Jack Warner, to loan him to David O. Selznick's studio to score the epic film Selznick had been working on for three years. Any guesses? Yes, that one. For Max Steiner, Gone with the Wind was really not about the North versus the South. It was, in many ways, I realized, a reflection of his own story, the story of a family dynasty that was once powerful and then lost everything, just like the Steiners, the story of someone fighting to make that family name important again, just like Max was doing. Nevertheless, Gone with the Wind would be the most stressful, exhausting experience of his career. The movie was nearly four hours long, and he had less than three months to write an epic symphonic score for it. And during those months, he had to write three other film scores, two of them for Warner Brothers and one for David O. Selznick, who, for no sane reason, was stealing Max from himself <laughs> to score another movie. Selznick micromanaged every note that Max was writing. He would send Steiner page after page of contradictory instructions. Then he'd hear the music for a scene and change his mind and want it a different way. The big premiere for the movie was coming up in Atlanta. You've probably seen some footage of that. And to finish this vast assignment on time, Max had to assign some of the cues to his team of orchestrators under his supervision. Even so, as the premiere date came ever closer, Selznick wrote in a studio memo, I do not see how we can get out even a bad score in the time remaining. Well, fortunately, Max delivered a great score. It's the closest thing he ever wrote to an opera in terms of its length and its multiple themes for different characters, places, and situations. First, we'll hear the most famous of those themes, Forterra. And after that, you'll see an excerpt from the end of the film, mostly with the music track alone, plus some text that I've added to show what Max is doing. Take my handkerchief. Never in any crisis of your life have I known you to have a handkerchief. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Gone with the Wind remains the highest grossing film adjusted for inflation of all time, and it raised Steiner's status even higher in Hollywood. 
But although Max was at his peak professionally, his personal life was falling apart. He was deeply in debt. His money managers had made a terrible mess of his tax filings, and that only got worse every year. Even when he was sick, he had to work, and by 1941, he was on the verge of a breakdown. Well, that July, everything came crashing down. After a bitter argument, Louise moved out of the house, leaving Steiner and their one-year-old son, Ronald. And during their three-year separation, Max channeled his intense emotions and his desire to reconcile with Louise into music for movies like this one. Now Voyager would be Steiner's favorite collaboration with his friend Betty Davis. He loved scoring her films because they allowed him to use music to take us inside a character's psychology. And contrary to what you may have heard, Davis was a great admirer of Max Steiner. She once called him my composer. She, she had him score the only film that she ever personally produced. And she once wrote, he often made our acting better. Here's the final scene of Now Voyager, and you don't need to know more than the fact that it is about two people in love who cannot be together, but who find a kind of peace in that. Jerry, please help me. Shall we just have a cigarette on it? Yes. win him his second Oscar, and just days after recording that score, Max began work on what would be his best love movie of all, Casablanca. Now, some of you may know that Max Steiner did not write the song as time goes by. It was written 11 years earlier, in 1931, by composer Herman Hupfeld for a Broadway show that closed after a few performances. What you may not know is that Max Steiner hated the song as time goes by. How could anyone hate that great song? Well, he loved Casablanca when he watched it, and he was so eager to write an original love theme, like that beautiful one that he did for Now Voyager. But as time goes by was used in the play that Casablanca was based on, and the film's producer, Hal Wallace, strongly and rightly felt that the song would be perfect in the movie. He ordered Steiner to use Herman Hupfeld's song, which was mostly forgotten by 1942, as the main love theme. And here's the remarkable thing about Steiner as a composer. Once he accepted that he had to use that theme, he wrote such heartbreaking variations on As Time Goes By that it's hard to believe he didn't love it and that he didn't compose it himself. Here is an example from the flashback sequence in Paris. What's wrong, kid? I love you so much. And I hate this war so much. Oh, it's a crazy world. Anything can happen. If you shouldn't get away. I mean, if... If something should keep us apart. 
wherever they put you, and wherever I'll be, I want you to know that. Kiss me. Kiss me as if it were the last time. I'm not tearing up, you're tearing up. <laughs> well, after World War II, as movies often became darker and more adult, Steiner modified his scoring style in an interesting way. His music often became more intimate and quietly dissonant for the Western noir pursued, and yes, there are Western noirs. Steiner wrote a really chilling score, all the more so for its understatement. Here is a clip from the climax as the villains stalk Robert Mitchum at his home. At his home. musician friend of mine calls that cue shark swimming backwards, but it's entirely coincidental. There are just so many notes on the keyboard. I love John Williams. Well, Steiner could do that, but he could also still go big when he needed to. And here's 30 seconds from Adventures of Don Juan, starring Errol Flynn. And it shows that Max, at age 60, could still swashbuckle with the best of them. I warned you, senor. This time I shall cut deeply. Be sure it's deep enough. The orchestra loved that so much that when they played that main title, they just broke into applause. The recording of it's really fun to hear, because Max kept the outtakes of his recording sessions, too. Boy, was I a lucky biographer. Well, the post-war era would be a rather tough one for Max. Uh, Louise did divorce him, and the one bright spot of this period was that Steiner found the perfect companion in Lee Blair, a family friend who became a loyal and loving spouse for the rest of his life. But the 1950s were very tough professionally. He was let go by Warner Brothers when he turned 65. His debts grew, he had eyesight problems. But then in 1959, a miracle happened. At age 71, he scored the Warner Brothers drama A Summer Place as a freelance job. And the soft rock theme that he wrote rather quickly for the film's young lovers, Molly and Johnny, became a totally unexpected pop music blockbuster. It topped the charts for nine weeks, sold seven million records, won Grammy of the, uh, the Grammy Record of the Year over Ella Fitzgerald and Elvis and Frank Sinatra. And Billboard magazine named it the best-selling instrumental of the rock and roll era, written by a 71-year-old Austrian. <laughs> And it put Max on solid financial footing for the rest of his life. Now, in case you have forgotten what that uh, very lucrative theme sounded like, here's a little of it. Well, Max scored movies until the age of 76, and despite an incredibly brutal work schedule, I'm happy to say that he managed to live to the age of 83. Today, his legacy is very much alive. His music is certainly heard every, every day somewhere in the world, and composers like John Williams continue the tradition of the orchestral theme-based scoring that Max pioneered. And incidentally, Steven Spielberg is a Steiner fan, and his affectionate nickname for John Williams is Max. To end my talk, I would like to share the final moments of that best-loved film we saw earlier, Casablanca, since I think it shows his greatest strength as a composer, his ability to turn human emotion, grief, hope, 
romantic ecstasy into music that still moves us. Max had a clever way at the end of a film score to play the story forward, to use music to tell us what would probably happen next to the characters. So Steiner does not end the movie with As Time Goes By, because for the character of Rick Blaine, that song represents the past, and Rick is finally able to move beyond it. Instead, Steiner ends the film with another theme, the French anthem, The Marseillaise, because that music tells us where Rick, the cynic turned patriot, is now going. You have any idea what you'd have to look forward to if you stayed here? Nine chances out of ten, we'd both wind up at a concentration camp. Isn't that true, Louis? I'm afraid, Major Strauss, I would insist. You're saying this only to make me go. I'm saying it because it's true. Inside of us, we both know you belong with Victor. You're part of his work, the thing that keeps him going. If that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. We didn't have, we, we lost it until you came to Casablanca. We got it back last night. When I said I would never leave you. And you never will. But I've got a job to do too. Where I'm going, you can't follow. What I've got to do, you can't be any part of. Hills, I'm no good at being noble, but it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. No, no. He's looking at you, kid. It might be a good idea for you to disappear from Casablanca for a while. There's a free French garrison over at Brazzaville. I could be induced to arrange a passage. My letter of transit? I could use a trip. But it doesn't make any difference about our bet. You still owe me 10,000 francs. And that 10,000 francs should pay our expenses. Our expenses? Mm-hmm. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. There is so much more to Max's story. He really lived the kind of life that could have been a Warner Brothers biopic that he scored. We don't have time to talk about Mildred Pierce or The Searchers or The Big Sleep or The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, but they are all talked about in this book with much more. And oddly, this book is available for purchase right after this, this discussion. So my lovely wife Michelle and I will be at that table in the back there. So if anyone would like a signed copy, uh, I would be honored to sign it for you. And, uh, of course, you can buy it from these places. I always mention Larry Edmonds since it's been around almost as long as these movies have in Hollywood uh, also. But it is here. Uh, and if you would like to get in touch with me, as I very much hope you will, please go to my website, which is simply mediastephen.com. That's Stephen with a V. I love to hear from people and discuss things I, and uh, discuss movies. And I have to admit, when I was researching Casablanca, I got to go through all the production reports on the movie start to finish and turn that into a whole separate talk of its own so we can, we can swap Casablanca stories. But with that, I am very, very happy to say that I would love to hear you. Thank you for listening and I would love to hear your questions. Thank you.